I'm pleased to introduce Dr. James Michael Brewer to our meeting tonight. Dr. Brewer completed his PhD in astronomy at Yale University in June 2016. His research involves exploring relationship, relationships between stellar properties and compositions and how those affect the planets that form around those stars. He is currently an assistant professor at San Francisco State University, where he is continuing his investigations into planet formation, as well as searching for new low mass planets for the express spectrometer as part of the Hunter Hearst project. When Dunn is not combing through stellar spectra, he can be found cooking, making ice cream, taking long bike trips, collaborating on astronomy based artwork, or taking more photographs than he has time to edit. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Green. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's, it's great. And uh, don't feel, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Uh, I prefer questions when you have them rather than me losing you along the way. But, uh, so, one of the things that I, my research has been focusing on is how common are, are planets around other stars and trying to find the small planets. And uh, I don't know if you can read it, but at the bottom here, I have a quote from Giordano Bruno in 1584, where he says, in space, there are countless constellations, suns and planets. We see only the suns because they give light. The planets remain invisible for they are small and dark. There are also numberless Earths circling around other suns. Now, uh, sorry. Uh, it would be nice to uh, just know that, and he stated it uh, just without any evidence. Is there something going on? That's all right. You're fine. Okay. No. Uh, trying to get the video. He stated it without any evidence and in 1584 and that among stating that there are plenty of people on all those planets as well and a few other things got him to burn at the stake a few years later <laughs> uh, but uh but it is something that's interested us for a long time right and so uh if you've been uh paying attention to new discoveries in astronomy you know that there's now uh, close to 5,200 uh, known planets. I got these, this information about a week ago. Uh, there's more discovered every day. Uh, and those planets are in around 3,882 stars. Okay? So we found all sorts of planets uh, since 1995 when we found, uh, we found the first one. Uh, but uh, how many of those are like the Earth, right? Because that's kind of what we want to know. Why do we want to know? We just like finding stuff like that, right? Uh, but uh, what we're interested in is these habitable planets. And so, if you if you read the news, we found tons of Earth-like planets. Uh, we found uh, some. This is just a, a quick Google. Uh, and there's all sorts of announcements every other month that we found the next Earth like planet. Uh, but as somebody who works in the field, I'll tell you that a lot of that is hyperbole. Uh, we shade what we mean by Earth like and uh, sun like and those kinds of things. So I'll, I'll tell you that the number is well, the number is one. Right? <laughs> And so the number of Earth like planets is the one that we already saw, you know, no doubt. Um, and oh, <laughs> messing around with things that I shouldn't be messing around with. How, how are these found? Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the there's been several methods where we found the, the most number of them, uh, transit and, and radio velocity. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about both of those. Uh, 
and, and the method that I've been looking at is using regular velocity as a model method. Uh, but oh, we're back. Uh, so we've we have found small planets. In fact, we found even planets that are smaller than the Earth. Uh, and we found planets that are on very distant orbits, like Jupiter's or even a little further. Uh, but what we haven't found are Earth-sized planets around a star like the Sun at an at a orbit that's nice and comfortable where we have liquid water on the surface. And that's kind of really what we mean when we say we're looking for Earth-like planets. Right? And so... It turns out that not only have we not found <clears throat> another Earth, but we actually haven't found anything that even looks like the solar system. Um, and so we've been looking now, well, we've been looking for hundreds of years, for thousands, right? Uh, we've been looking seriously for uh, at least 50, 60 years, uh, and we've been successful for 30 uh, at finding planets. Uh, or close to 30. Uh, and so you start to wonder, do they exist? Do solar systems like ours actually exist? And um, I didn't know that was coming up on the next slide. Uh, and so I want to step back a minute and then say, why are we looking for these things in the first place? And these nice travel posters from NASA make it seem like we're going to go there and pay now. Uh, and, you know, we might say that, you know, maybe we just want to see them. Maybe we want to colonize them. Uh, maybe, maybe just we want to know that they're there. But, but really, the real answer is that we want to know if anybody else is out there. Right? We want to know they're meaning to talk back to us just as we knew that they were there in the, in the first place. And so we've got scientists all over the world who are now searching. And one of the first uh, people to do so was Frank Drake, who's a Bay Area astronomer, and I'm sure you all have heard of him, who made this equation that he's calling the Drake equation, but that we now call the Drake equation, to just estimate if it was even worth looking in the first place. And what he wanted to calculate for a, a meeting was just a quick, all right, how many civilizations might be out there that we can even look for? And so he took the rate of star formation or a star there, and uh, that turns out to be about a few per year. And they knew that in 1961 when Frank Drake formulated this. Uh, and then the fraction of those stars that form every year that have planets. And we didn't know that at all. We hadn't found any other than the solar system. Uh, the fraction of those that are habitable, or probably the number of those, uh, number of planets in that star system that has planets that are habitable, the fraction of those that develop life, the fraction of those that form intelligent life, and uh, Seth Shostak is a researcher at SETI Institute here in the Bay Area. And he gave a talk once uh, where he said, how do you define intelligence? <laughs> well, one way to say that would be just if you can build a radio telescope because you can talk to other civilizations. Turn to your neighbor, can they build a radio telescope? <laughs> so how do we determine intelligence? Um, and so, that brings up communication. You have to be intelligent enough to communicate. You have to want to communicate. And you have to exist for some period of time. And then you can see from this equation that if you have all of these things where just big question marks, you're not going to get very reliable answers, right? And so I have my students work through this at the beginning of the exoplanets class I teach. And then I have them do it again at the end. And their answers typically change, but the answers in the class typically range for between, from between zero and several million. Um, and so there's either nobody out there to talk to or there's several million. But it's still interesting to try and look for whether or not we can find planets like our own and whether or not we can find life on them and maybe 
Life don't talk to us, right? So this question was just asked, how do we look for those uh, planets? How do we discover them? And the short answer is we take advantage of physics. And the first thing we can do is take advantage of the fact that if you have a bright, shiny object and you pass a dark one in front of it, the bright, shiny object will dim. Uh, so uh, this is the transit method. Uh, so if you happen to be looking at a star system where the planets pass right in front of the stars, uh, then as the planet crosses between you and the star, a very small fraction of that light uh, will be dimmed, and you'll be able to detect not only the, the, the size ratio between the radius of the planet and the radius of the star, but if you watch it enough times, you'll be able to start, determine the um, period of the orbit. The problem is you have to watch continuously. You don't know when it's going to pass in front of the star. Uh, and if you happen to be looking on the wrong day, you'll miss it. And so our solution to that was just to put the telescope in space where you can watch 24-7. Uh, and the most successful of these was the Kepler mission. Uh, it ran from 2010 through 2018, uh, first staring just at one patch of the sky where they could watch a... Um, 150,000 stars simultaneously, uh, taking measurements uh, uh, on two different cadences, uh, a very short cadence where they're watching every 30 seconds and then a, a longer cadence, which uh, I'm forgetting now, I think five minutes. Um, and from that, we've we found tons of planets, but it turns out that that perfect angle means that you're only finding 1% of the, the systems that exist. So the fact that we found so many started to give us a hint that planet formation is easy. And that was one of the first questions in, in Frank Drake's, Drake's equation, right? How many stars form planets? So we're starting to get at this, this question. Uh, another uh, piece of physics that you can look at is you can use the fact that planets don't orbit their star. Planets and stars orbit the common center of mass between them. Mm -hmm. Now, stars weigh about a million times more than the planets do, uh, thousands to a million times. And so that point is generally very close to the star. And it means that the star, although it's orbiting that point uh, in the same time period, so the sun orbits that point in one year, just as we go around that point in one year. Uh, but it doesn't have as far to go. And so it's not moving very quickly. We're moving at 30 kilometers per second around that point. It's moving at nine and a half centimeters per second around that point. Uh, so you have to measure very precisely. And the way that we do that is with the Doppler effect. And this is the same Doppler effect that you are probably already familiar with the sirens, right? When the siren uh, comes towards you, you hear a high pitched sound, and when it goes away from you, you hear a lower pitched sound. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing happens with light. And so here in this animation, you see the planet going around the star. The telescope is looking at the star. The telescope can't see the planet. Mm -hmm. It's taking a spectrum. And it's watching the, the light from that star when the planet comes, pardon me, when the star comes toward the telescope, that light will be shifted to higher frequencies, blue shifted. And when it goes away from the planet, pardon me, away from the telescope, it'll be red shifted. Uh, and using that, uh, we've also found a lot of planets. Uh, in fact, the first planets uh, were actually discovered using the radio velocity curve. Uh, since since 1995, uh, with that first discovery, we found close to 4,000 planets using the transit technique, about 1,000 uh, using the radio velocity method. And then there's some other methods that seem promising that, but are very challenging in practice. Uh, some of those have been one of the first ones. You can think, well, what if I look at the sky if the star is tugging it around? 
being towed around by the planet gutter, then why can't I just look up at the sky and watch that star wiggle around on the sky? That seems like it should be nice and easy. But it turns out that that one depends upon your distance. And stars are pretty far away. And so that wiggle is very, very small. Mm -hmm. And so to date, we've only found two planets via astrometry. That may change with the Gaia space mission that's been up there. It's measuring things very precisely. Uh, there's been uh, some success recently with direct imaging, where we actually just take images of the planets around other stars. Uh, gravitational microlensing, uh, looking at the uh, the way that the star and the planet change the light and background stars, and uh, pulsar timing, which was actually some of the first discoveries, but they get overlooked because they don't seem like real planets. Um, but um, the the two that I highlighted, transits and radio velocities, uh, give you different information. Both of them give you the period. Uh, of the orbit uh, from which you can you can get the distance from the star, but uh, transits give you the radius of the planet, whereas radio velocities give you the mass. And so, ideally, you want both of those things if you want to start characterizing these planets and figuring out what they're like. Uh, and so, the planets that we're starting to to look at most often are the ones that are transiting. And then we can go back and measure the masses. Um, so I started off with a slightly provocative statement in the title that we found thousands of planets, but we haven't found any solar systems. And so what do I mean by a solar system? The solar system, right? And this is the typical picture that we've seen in school books and things. And I'm sure the Astronomy Club knows is totally unrealistic, right? Uh, that things are much further apart. And I found this cool animation uh, that's showing that orbits of just the inner system. Right? We've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars here going around. And they're widely separated. The green area is the habitable zone. I guess you can see the green area. Uh, and we've got one planet uh, kind of skimming the inner edge of that habitable zone, us, and another just outside of Mars. Uh, and at different points in the solar system's history, Venus may have been more or less habitable. Uh, but uh, this idea of widely spaced, and the rest of the planets won't even fit on my page, right? So they're much further away. So this idea of widely spaced planets and I'm sorry for the switching back to the unrealistic view, but now the sizes of the planets are roughly in scale. And we have an assortment of planets in our system. We have a bunch of small ones on the inside uh, and larger ones on the outside. Jupiter is substantially larger than the terrestrial planets. The ice giants are in between. And with transits, uh, it's actually hard to find anything beyond about half the orbit of Mercury. Mm -hmm. So the further away that you go from the star, the harder it is to find the planet. With radio velocity, the bigger the planet, the easier it is to find. Uh, and as you go further away, it's also harder to find, but that basically is just time uh, and precision. And so you can improve your precision over time and find smaller things further out. But it means that we've had difficulty with both of our primary techniques of finding planets, with finding any planets that look like those in the solar system. What have we found? Uh, so I keep mentioning 1995, and I'm sure that many of you already know that in 1995, a team from Europe, uh, Didier Kilos and Michel Mayor, discovered 51 Pegasus B. It's a planet about half the size of Jupiter that orbits its star in four days. So that was completely unexpected. 
that we were hoping to find something that looked like the solar system. And with the telescopes at the time, they could have barely found Jupiter. Uh, they, uh, Jupiter tugs on the sun, moving the sun around at about 12 meters per second. Uh, and so with the radial velocity technique and the precision at the time, they figured all we have to do is wait 12 years or so and we'll be able to see it. Instead, what they found was this really high noise. And that high noise was a short period planet that was very massive, tugging its star around at 60 meters per second. Uh, and that was well within the decision. After that, we found quite a few of those. With the transit technique, uh, we, as I mentioned, we found many on short period orbits. And so this is a little animation. The dashed lines here are the planets in the solar system. Uh, the inner system there, uh, those four planets, we've got Jupiter, Saturn, uh, and the rest of the planets are fitting on this plot at the moment. To the same scale, are all of the systems discovered by Kepler between 2010 and 2018. And they've just been placed over plotted on the solar system so that you can see the size of those other planetary systems compared to the size of the solar system. And this, although the planets aren't to scale with their orbits, they are to scale with one another. So you can also see that a lot of those are also very big planets. So primarily what we've been finding are very big planets on very short orbits. Uh, and uh, I'm going to switch back to radial velocities. I keep going back and forth between the transit and radial velocities here. This uh, plot shows planets by year of discovery uh, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is the signal strength for that discovered planet. In other words, how easy it was to find. So um, at the top of the, the scale, you have about 100 meters per second. Um, and as I said, this is where you can find Jupiter. Right, so we found a bunch of planets that have much larger signals than Jupiter. This is where you would find Saturn. So it wasn't until about 2005, 10 years after we started, that we were able to start finding planets kind of with the same signal strength as Saturn. But that's where we are. So finding Earth around the sun is hard. What, what areas of the sky are you looking at now with, with these techniques? So I understood at one point that the areas were pretty limited, actually. Yeah, it's a great question. So he asked, uh, what areas of the sky are we looking at? Please? And uh, with, the, with the radio velocity technique, there, we're covering all of the area of the sky where we have precision radio velocity instruments. Uh, we now have instruments in the southern hemisphere and in the northern hemisphere. So we're covering most of the sky. But the radio velocity technique, you have to look at one star at a time. The nice thing about the transit technique is you get to look at 150,000 at a time. Uh, and so the reason that we found only about 1,000 radio velocity planets and uh, 5,000 or more or 4,000 or more uh, transiting planets is that you get to look at a lot at a time. With the transiting planets, though, you have to stare at one spot for a really long time. And so the Kepler mission, its first four years, stared at a spot that was, uh, I can't even remember how big it was, uh, less than a degree on the sky, um, far less, I think. So that was just a little tinsel beam in the galaxy. Uh, since then, it started looking at other little pencil beams uh, for the remaining four years of its life. Uh, but the TESS mission is actually looking at the entire sky. Uh, and so that's changing now what, what planets we're finding 
uh, the precision of tests, the transiting exoplanet survey satellite uh, is lower than it was for uh, Kepler. Uh, but the benefit is that it's covering the, the whole sky. But the longest period it looks like, looks for, pardon me, is 180 days. And so it will not find any planets on orbits longer than 180 days. Um, I've also broken out the types of planets that we found. So we found like 1,600 gas giant planets. So these are planets the size of Jupiter, Saturn. Um, about 1,800 Neptunes and sub Neptunes. Now, what's a sub Neptune? Right? We don't even have one added to call it a sub Neptune, right? And same with super Earths. We don't have any super Earths in the solar system either. And yet, those are the two largest categories of planets that we found super Earths and sub Neptunes. Uh, so it turns out that the most common planets so far that we know of are ones that don't exist in the solar system. Now, I told you, though, that we can't find the small ones, so we don't know how many of the terrestrial ones. He says there's only 190 of them found. Those are the size of the terrestrial planets here in the solar system, but we haven't really been able to find very many of them. So, pardon me, we, we haven't had the capability to find very many of them. I've got another plot. Uh, so I, this one's a little more uh, complex, so I'll walk you through it. On the left, we have radio velocity detected planets, and on the right, we have transit detections. Um, on the left hand axis of the left plot is the mass of the planet, and on the right hand, the left hand axis of the of the transit plot, we have the radius. Across the bottom on both, we have orbital period. And you can see that if you look at the radio velocity detections, we do have plenty at longer periods. We find plenty of these out to like 10 year orbits. It's great. Uh, but here in the, the transit detections, we have maybe a handful that get to about a year, but really the transit detections drop off at about 40 days. Uh, and once you get to 100 days, you just have a kind of light sprinkling of, of the planets. Uh, and so we know that there's plenty of small ones there. We see that one Earth radius planets are not uncommon near transits, uh, but they're completely missing over there in the radio velocities. And this actually comes down to the precision of the radio velocity instruments until. Um, 2018, there were no instruments that could measure better than about one to two meters per second. Uh, and so uh, those red points on there uh, at the bottom are the best that we can do. But I told you that Earth is like 10 centimeters per second. Uh, so uh, we actually started building in 2016 this that we put on our telescope in. Uh, Arizona in 2018, uh, the express spectrograph. And the goal wasn't to get all the way down to 10 centimeters per second because it's kind of beyond our budget and our capabilities at the moment, but we wanted to get down to 20 or 30 centimeters per second. So maybe we could find Earth but around a slightly smaller star, or maybe we could find a super Earth but in the habitable zone. Uh, and we're joined now by Espresso in the Southern Hemisphere, made by the same team that found the first planet in 1995, and another team, NUID, uh, that also has a, a spectrograph in Arizona. And uh, we're all getting about 20 to 30 centimeters per second. Um, you don't need to know the details, or if you're interested, I can tell you about them, but it's a it's what it's called a fiber fed spectrograph. So, a fiber optic cable hooks up to the back of the telescope and it goes to the spectrograph. Um, and uh, we've been taking science observations since 2019. Uh, we use what's called a laser frequency comb to calibrate each image so that we know precisely where the wavelengths are of light. 
because remember what we're looking for is we're looking for the light to be slightly blue shifted and slightly red shifted and that shift is smaller for smaller planets so that's what we're trying to measure uh, in fact we're trying to measure the shift in light that's about the width of a few silicon atoms uh, and so our spectrograph is here with Ryan for scale um, and yeah you, you said to ask questions um, sure how how do you account for the effect of multiple of possible multiple planets on one star I mean it's not as easy mathematically obviously it's just one planet studying that studying what you're talking about that's a great question so he asked what if there's multiple planets around the star uh and how do you disentangle that right so the the answer is it is hard uh if you know that there are two planets then they actually add together and so the signal is is relatively easy to to recreate if you don't know though you have to take more and more measurements to make sure that you know that it's the planet you're you think you're looking for there might be multiple solutions and i'll show you a little bit of our data uh later where you can see how we did it you can tell me whether you're not you believe that there's a planet there <laughs> um so this is the spectrograph it sits down in a room it sits on its own pier it's also on vibration isolating springs uh this is a giant vacuum chamber so that um once it was finished, it's actually insulated, and you can't see this anymore. But uh, the uh, spectrograph itself also sits on vibration damping springs, uh, and the fiber optic cables you see over there over Ryan's head come in to the spectrograph. Uh, it's also uh, kept at ten to the minus seven four, so it's very low pressure, uh, and the whole idea is. We don't want it to move. We don't want the temperature to change. We don't want the pressure to change, uh, and we want to make sure that the light coming in is always coming in, coming in in exactly the same way. And that, uh, with the that, that is the goal of of making sure that our instrument isn't introducing any errors greater than five centimeters per second. Uh, yeah. What kind of ratios do you do on something like that? uh panicky ones <laughs> uh so spectrographs like this are one-off instruments they're custom built by grad students like me at the time uh as well as postdocs and things like that they're very finicky instruments the vacuum works great uh, the uh laser frequency cone needs to be adjusted about every other night uh, and we keep calling the uh, people in germany who built it uh, asking them to log on and see what's going on now mm -hmm. uh, there's parts that wear out like there's a fiber optic cable that goes from the laser frequency cone into the spectrograph it's fifteen thousand dollars for the cable mm -hmm. and the amount of laser light we're shining down it uh, deteriorates the cable in about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, latest thing that happened was a uh, we have a a lamp to calibrate just where the spectral lines are on the detector. It's called a flat lamp, uh, and it's a special LED that's tuned to our detector. And it was built in Canada, and it just a couple of the LEDs went out and so for a month we were down because we had to ship it back to Canada hmm. because no one knew the type of soldering that they've used uh, to put it together uh, so it it's you know bailing wire and bubble gum it's uh it's held together by the seven people on my team that know a little bit about this or a little bit about that. It's your baby. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so those are all the instrumental challenges, right? Just getting it stable enough so that you're not messing up anything. But the problem is that the star wants to mess up things too. Um, so stars aren't just light bulbs. 
Um, they're got all this boiling, boiling motion going on. We're also moving around the sun, and I told you 30 kilometers per second, you have to deal with that. But we're not really moving around the sun at 30 kilometers per second. We're moving around the common center of mass of all the planets in the solar system. And from our perspective, that moves around. So we have to know how that's moving around. Uh, so there's all these things that you need to think about and take care of. And it turns out in the beginning of the year, we actually had that wrong. Uh, and I thought I was publishing some planets at the beginning of the year. And then I found that error. And I realized I didn't have any planets at all. And then when I fixed it, I had different planets. <laughs> so it all worked out. But um, so uh, I said we've been on observing since 2019. So in June of 2019, we started a high cadence survey, survey that we called the 100 Earth Survey. And what that is, is we were specifically targeting those planets that I showed you, those two plots side by side, all the radial velocity ones were missing the small ones, and both of them were missing the medium sized ones at longer periods. That's what we're targeting with this. We want to find those planets because we think that they're there. We know that they're the short period ones are there because we see them in transits. And we assume that there's more like solar system, and so we're looking for those two. Yes. Yeah. What spectral types and targeting? This, uh, for the 100 Earth Survey, we're only targeting G and K stars. So that's stars like the sun, about 5,800 Kelvin, down to, uh, what is it, about 4,700 Kelvin. Uh, and the reason for that is G and K stars are cool and like us, whereas M stars are cooler, uh, harder. The planets are closer, which would actually make finding them easier. but the uh, like, likelihood of them being habitable is lower. Uh, and because they're also fainter, that was easy to, to rule out. We can actually only, uh, with our, our 4.3 meter telescope, we're looking at only uh, stars brighter than seven planet. So you can see most of the targets we're looking at. Um, I've got another plot, and don't worry, you don't actually have to understand this one too much, other than what I'm showing you is three years of data for six of the quietest stars in our, in our program. And um, you can see in each of them, the top number, the RMS scatter. So that's the total amount of scatter that that star had over the three years um, in its radial velocity. The lowest one is 62 centimeters per second. So that one looks like a pretty quiet star. The highest one is a 1.13 meters per second. So these are very nice quiet stars. And we picked them because they were quiet from other instruments. They had several meter per second scatter because a lot of that scatter was the instrument. So we built a, a nice quiet instrument. The other thing to notice is that the intranight scatter, so just in one night, if we take multiple images of the same star, uh, it's only 20 to 30 centimeters per second, well, 20 to 40 maybe. Uh, so it looks like our instrument is as quiet as we were looking for. We really do get 20 centimeters per second precision. And what that means is that we can start finding systems like this one. So this one isn't published yet. Uh, I sent it in at the beginning of the month. Um, Rho Corona Borealis is a very interesting system because in 2007, pardon me, in 1997, the seventh planet ever discovered was found. That's B here. Um, it's a Jupiter mass planet, uh, roughly, on a 39 day orbit. So it's not like Jupiter, it's in close. Um, but it was nice and easy to find. C here is a 103 day orbit with a 30 Earth mass planet. So now it's one and a half times Neptune, but it wasn't found until 2016. D and E here are planets that we found in addition to those two using the express spectrograph. Uh, D is a 19 Earth mass planet, so right about exactly Neptune. 
uh, on a 277 day orbit. And E is an eccentric planet on a 13 day orbit uh, that's only four Earth masses. So this system is not like the solar system. Okay? However, it's also not quite like any of the other systems we've been finding either. Uh, this is the one I was going to ask you if you believe me. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that late earlier. Uh, so in multi-planet systems, this is the overall signal that we get, and these are the residuals to that to my fit. So the blue line is my model of the whole system. The yellow points are our measurements. Here I've broken out each of the components, each of the planets that went into making that larger model. Because that one planet is so large, you mainly just see the large one. Um, but if you zoom in, you'll be able to see uh, these smaller ones. Um, so this one is published. Well, this one is being published. Um, and we've got a bunch of others. And so I wanted to show you uh, a very exciting one. So this one looks messier. This one, I'm not showing you the overall model, just the two planets that we've uh, possibly discovered in the system. One is on a 56-day orbit and one is on a, a four-day orbit. Um, but remember I told you about the radial velocity precision and I showed you that declining graph but it kind of bottomed out at about a meter per second. This signal is 42 centimeters per second. And so we're starting to now find these much smaller planets. Yeah. So, well, what, what the temperature on the surface of the planet that only orbits the sun for seven days? That only orbits the sun in four days? Um, it's over a thousand Kelvin. Uh, so it's anyway. like a lava. Yes, it's like a lava planet. In fact, we found a lot of those, and it's they've been very nice for some follow up transit studies because. If you're only orbiting your star in four days, the likelihood that you're transiting from our perspective is pretty high because there's many, many angles that you can look at and still see you transiting, right? Um, and so we've been able to do atmospheric studies of these planets. Of course, they're interesting for their own sake, not like we're actually going to find uh, life on those planets or, or think that they're like the Earth. Um, so that actually brings me back to this. And so I've said this several times, but here I've plotted up um, the period on the bottom. On the left, I've just got different systems. Uh, the size of these planets are all um, to scale. For, uh, with each other, and you can see the scale here, one Earth uh, mass planet, 20 Earth mass planet. I chose these systems solely uh, if they had four or more planets in the system, uh, and they had measured masses. And one final criteria, I said, none of the four planet, four or more planets could have a period longer than 100 days. And I, and I wanted to look at that because remember from that other graph we had, I said beyond 100 days, you don't really have any transiting planets anymore. So I wanted to see what transiting planets we had. And all of these, uh, except the last three there, were discovered via transits. But you notice something interesting about these systems. All the planets are around the same size and they're all very close together, right? Uh, this is the furthest planet out here at 100 days, so just, just under 100 days. Uh, so imagine that. Mercury there at roughly 90 days. Uh, this These systems all have four or five planets inside 90 days. Uh, I, I wanted to do the same thing, but I changed one criteria. And I said, what if one of those planets, one or more, is on a period longer than 100 days? What do I get then? And then I get some more interesting systems. So these are all of the systems that we know of that have four or more planets, and at least one of those planets is on an orbit longer than 100 days. 
you'll notice that there's still a bunch of these planets systems with planets all about the same size. But you also notice that on the outside, you often have big planets. And there's a few exceptions to that. There's this one, 55 Cancri. Uh, by the way, we've got a nature paper coming out on that soon too, um, where we've measured the uh, spin orbit alignment of the, of the system, which is exciting. Um, this one, GJ876, and on both of those, you can see there's a mixture of planets, kind of like in our system, not quite the same, but there's some small planets and some big planets. Uh, there's um, the second one, there's a small planet inside and outside, and then big planets on the inside. There's this one, WASP 47. Again, this mixture of sizes. And then finally, HD143761, which is Rho Corona Borealis, the one that we just discovered. And so we're starting to find different types of systems, uh, even if we're not quite finding the solar system yet. That's true. We are getting, that's a nice system where we're getting them spaced a little further apart, although that line is still at 100 days. So you've got four inside 100 days and one outside. Uh, yeah. I forget how big are the smallest dots and how big are the biggest dots? The smallest dots on there are, are Earth size. Uh, the biggest dots are much larger than Jupiter. So the, the bottom here, I have a 300 Earth mass planet, which is about the size of Jupiter. Uh, and a lot of those dots are bigger than that. Uh, for instance, in 143761, the big dot there is 385 Earth masses, so just a little bigger than Jupiter. There is a head in front of the lens in the following Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you have, you know how old these systems are, how old are the stars? That's a great question. I don't know for a lot of them, but I do for Rooker and Borealis, the top one there, uh, because it's 10 giga years old. Uh, and so it's a very interesting system for many reasons. Uh, when it was young, that 280 day planet was actually in the habitable zone. Now it's a 19 Earth mass planet, so it's not going to be the same kind of habitable planet that we think of as Earth. But it is interesting that it was could have had liquid water on its surface. Uh, for the rest, there are a range. Typically, most of them are going to be older than a giga year or two because younger planets, uh, probably younger stars are more active, they rotate faster. Uh, even younger stars are buried in their birth clouds and hard to see. Uh, and so typically we're looking at slightly older stars. So we haven't had found another Earth and we haven't found another solar system like our own. Um, but do they exist? And so that was my, my original question. My guess is they do exist. And then we just haven't been able to find them. Uh, and that's, so our whole program is starting to try and dig in and, and find those things that we've been missing before. Um, and so if we return then to our Drake equation, uh, we know that that's a few per year. We've actually now nailed this down. We know that there is about one planet per star, at least. In other words, almost every star has planets. Um, right now, we also even know that with the statistics that we have, and remember I told you we're only seeing 1% of the stars and we're biased to only the ones that have close to the planets. On average, if a star has planets, it probably has three or more. Uh, that's also exciting. Uh, the number in the habitable zone, we have no idea. Here we could say, well, Venus may have been at some point, and Mars could be, and Earth is. So we'll call it somewhere between one and three, right? Uh, but we still don't know this or this or this or that. So we still have 
a long way to go in order to answer these questions, but there actually are a lot of people working on those questions as well. And uh, it's a lot of fun right now uh, being at the point where we can start uh, finding out if there is life on other planets and where that might be. Yeah, I don't know what that is other than <laughs> uh, So, yes. Well, the relative congestion of, I mean, these planets are much more congested, right? So, they're just 60 to be found. With that congestion, I mean, we, you know, all of us really like it to be between 65 and 75, right? <laughs> right. Would that congestion of planets interfere enough to define it? That's an interesting question. So, what would the tightly packed planets uh, play havoc with the climate mm -hmm. if, say, that these this pattern extended? Over into the habitable zone. Uh, it should, if that system stays stable, then the gravitational effect of those planets is going to stay far enough away. Uh, probably it is, it's not going to have a, a large effect on the, on the planet either. Uh, maybe you'll have stronger tides, so maybe it'll be good for surfing, or maybe it won't. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a good question. Although, What's interesting is the reason that I actually looked at this is a colleague of mine had looked at this plot, not the one that I made, but just this one. She was looking at even more planets because she didn't require them to have a mass. She was just wanted them to have a radius. And she noticed something odd, and that was, where is the, where's the sixth planet here? Clearly we can find planets further out, right? You had five planets in a row that were all evenly spaced. Where's the sixth one? Why isn't it there? Is it because it's a big planet much further out? And so we're missing it because transits don't? But then that means like what changed the system? And I think that what was interesting here is that does look like it's true. There's a bunch of close ones in and then a big one much further out. Um, that it could be that although we have a bunch of little ones on the inside, the one that's in the habitable zone is all by itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's a chat question which had to do with is the temperature scale Kelvin? Oh, yes, it is. Sorry. Uh, I, I never described the temperature scale, but the colors of the dots are the equilibrium temperatures of the planets in Kelvin. Um, and Shoot, I'm blanking right now. Our equilibrium temperature is, I think, 255 Kelvin. Is that correct? Does anybody else know? It's it's below freezing, uh, and it's our atmosphere that actually warms us up to a, a reasonable temperature. Uh, and so, basically, you're looking for something in the dark blue range. Yes. Um, based on your presentation, I like the translating method. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm all for radial velocities. I think that we need the masses, oh, okay. uh, but it's also the one that I've invested in. I think that the the transiting method is great if you want to get a quick survey, and now that we know all these close-in planets exist, it works well. Right? But to get those farther out planets, we either need a space telescope that's willing to sit there for 20 years staring at the same thing and much, much higher capabilities than Kepler did so that we can find the 1% of transiting planets that happen to transit on three year, 12 year orbits, right? So we'd never find Jupiter with a transit survey, but it's relatively easy to find a radio velocity survey. The drawback, like I said, is that radio velocity surveys, they're flying. Uh, the message I got just before coming here was last night, uh, we observed five targets that were good. Uh, and the time is expensive. Uh, we use a relatively small telescope at only 4.3 meters. Uh, and it cost us $18,000 a night to use the telescope. So. Uh, the theory of our solar system is a plan of 
So yes, uh, during the life of the solar system, uh, we think that our planets actually moved around quite a bit, especially in the early part of the life of the solar system, and how would that affect uh, our work? They don't move fast enough for us to notice. Uh, so if over a million years uh, Jupiter were to migrate in over the 20 years that we're looking, we wouldn't really notice it moving much. If, if you had time on James Webb to get a spectrograph the end of the week, which one do you want? Um, that's a great question because we are starting to look at that very thing. And, and out of the ones that we have so far, we're gonna we're probably gonna want to start with one that also transits. So back to the, the preference to the transiting method. Um, because James Webb won't be able to really get a spectrum of the atmosphere of a planet that's not transiting. Uh, it just doesn't have that capability right now, or, or won't. Um, we'll need another telescope. In fact, Louvoir uh, may actually have that capability. So the large UVIR optical telescope or something like that. But would the masses help inform that decision? It would indeed. Uh, and so what I would want is we're sensitive to um, about planets between two and four Earth masses all the way out to uh, a few hundred day orbits. I'd love to look at one of those uh, and see what that looks like. And there are ways that we can get some information actually from repeated spectral observations, something um, you can kind of get the reflected light spectrum off of the planet. Yeah, is, is there any way of uh, sort of solving some of these great questions um, to, to, to look at some of these planets and determine the localized factors, the atmospheres, the water, things like that yet? Or, or is that still stuff that is worse? So for habitability, there's yeah. a lot of ways that we've thought of. Uh, Could you repeat the question? Oh, please? sure. Uh, could we look at um, some of the other properties of the planets and, and derive from that some of the other uh, unknowns of the Drake equation? Uh, for instance, habitability. Uh, we want to know if a planet is habitable, we don't just want to know if it's in the habitable zone, we also want to know if it has an atmosphere, and if that atmosphere has both oxygen and carbon dioxide, for instance, which would be a pretty good indicator that it could at least support life like our own. And water, yeah. And water, right. Uh, and so you can, you can target those things. You can uh, look at, uh, well, where the planet is, how massive it is, if it transits, you can try and get some kind of atmospheric spectra. And because you know both the radius and the mass, you can work out the scale height of the atmosphere, the pressure scale height. Uh, you can start seeing some of the constituents of the atmosphere. And we've done this for much larger planets uh, or much hotter planets, as some of you referred to earlier. Uh, and so combining those things, we can start to get at all right, now we see a bunch of these that are kind of like this, and we measured this one, and so we'll just extrapolate and assume they all look like that, because that's what the astronomers do. And uh, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> and, uh, and from that, try and work out at least how many are habitable. That's one more unknown on our list. Your data, do you extract other orbital parameters like inclination or what? So it turns out inclination is very hard. Right. Uh, and inclination, if the planet happens to also be transiting, you can nail down pretty well. It's going to be almost as wrong. Um, but you can get eccentricity, uh, something we call the argument of periostron passage, so how uh, the angle between. Well, let's just call it an angle uh, for the closest approach to the star. Uh, what else do we get? 
Um, you can, there are a couple of other techniques. So for instance, in a transiting system, you can, uh, related to this timing question that we got earlier, um, you expect a uh, Keplerian orbit, a uh, planet orbiting in a common center of mass to have a very regular period. But if you watch some of the transiting planets, they don't. And this gets back to the uh, gravitational effect question from earlier as well. Uh, sometimes they're close enough that they can tug on the planet forward and backwards so that it arrives a little late or a little early. Uh, and these transit timing variations can then tell you things about the, the masses of the planets without having to get to the radial velocity question. Uh, and that can tell you about the density of the planet. Do you have um, any idea like, how the light, you know, that's how you figure out the stuff, right? Uh, I I do have, I don't know where it is. Sorry, I didn't think to put it in. Uh, I have a picture of our observing interface where what we look at is one star at a time. Uh, and so we typically are observing for about 10 minutes per target. And so we have what's called a fast tip tilt camera. Uh, so we have a, a stage that can move around to make sure that the fiber is always directly underneath the star. Uh, so the atmosphere moves the star around. It's kind of a poor man's adaptive optics. So we're not really moving the optics around, we're just catching the, all the light that we can. Uh, and we have a camera pointed at that and it's a mirrored surface so that you can see it really well. That's what we see of the star, and I've taken movies of that because it's kind of cool to see the star dance around. Next time you come to talk, you can bring one. Okay, sure. Uh, but the spectra are stationary. The spectra, uh, I think I actually, I should have pointed out, that is a spectrum from Express. That's only a slice of it. Uh, it's a 10,000 by 10,000 pixel CCD. Uh, and these, these spectra are about 200 bags a piece. Um, in fact, we even throw away some stuff where there's not really any spectra, so we throw away those pixels and they're still about 200 bags. Yeah. Would it be an advantage to have a spectrum that's not a space telescope? It would, uh, but it's even more technologically challenging than putting Express together uh, because. The thing with radio velocity surveys is that precision. Remember, I showed you that it's you know sitting on this vibration isolating pier and all that. So um, with what um, if you've heard of the of Lisa, uh, the laser interferometer space something or other? <laughs> uh, it's a it's a gravitational wave telescope in space. Uh, they're planning on putting it hundreds of kilometers, each of the, the pieces, hundreds of kilometers apart from one another, um, hundreds of thousands. Uh, and uh, so if they can successfully pull that off, then I'm sure that we can get a stable enough spectrograph in space. But spectrographs are heavy. Uh, there's not a whole lot of ways to shrink the, the optics down. Uh, and so what you have to do is have something that's, that's pretty massive up there. The, the, what we have to pay, I'd love that to be And the question of, uh, Planet orbit inclination to the star. Uh, is there a way with your um, uh, transit method to determine uh, a path, a, a visible path, and measure the angle of uh, uh, would be the apparent z axis with the star? So I'm going to show you. Uh, sorry, it's going to take me a second to pull this up. Uh, you can't with, well, short answer, yes, sort of. 
So you get a good constraint on the path across the star from the transit method. Uh, but not an exact one. And you also don't know how that star is um, how that star is rotating with respect to uh, how the um, planet is orbiting. Basically. 